to carry on uh, where we stopped on Tuesday. Actually, Tuesday's topic was uh, new birth and growth. That is the topic. And as we are born again, we must remember that all of us are called to uh, live by faith and live by the spirit and live by the word. So Christian life is a life of faith. And uh, having come to believe in Jesus, we are born again into a new birth. We have new birth into a living hope. And the rest of our lives is by faith, faith in God's word, faith in the Lord Jesus. And uh, as we live by faith, it po it's possible that sometimes our faith gets you know, affected. There are things that affect our faith. It should not happen, but it does happen sometimes. And God wants us to be a people who live by faith and don't waver in faith. Don't waver. Uh, if you look at uh, the life of Abraham, uh, in the book of Romans, chapter 4, verses 18 to 21, Paul writes, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And so became the father of many nations. I've been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening his faith, he faced the fact his body was as good as dead. And Sarah's womb also was dead. But he didn't waver through unbelief. He didn't waver through unbelief and, and give glory to God, being strengthened, give glory to God, strengthen the faith, give glory to God, being fully persuaded God had power to do what he has promised. Against all hope based on circumstances, Abraham, in hope in God, believed. In hope in what God has said, believed. And so began father of many nations. And it says about him, so shall your offspring be. Each one of us is actually an offspring of Abraham. If you look at the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, chapter 51, verse 1 and 2, uh, Isaiah writes, listen to you, listen to you who seek righteousness, who seek the Lord, who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you are cut. The quarry from whom from which you have been hewn. Look to Abraham, your father. Now, of course, that is addressed to the Israelites in Old Testament time. But in the New Testament, having come to believe in Jesus, you and me are children of Abraham. It says in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 16, the promise is spoken to Abraham and to his seed. People don't say, and to seize many, many people. But, and to his seed, many one person who is Christ. Verse 29 says, If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed, and as according to the promise. So all of us are Abraham's offspring, but through faith in Christ. So when the Bible says, So shall an offspring be to Abraham, we are called to be like Abraham and have the faith of Abraham. Faith of Abraham. Unwavering faith. He faced the fact his body was as good as dead. But he didn't waver through our belief. Given the promise of God. Strengthen the faith, being fully persuaded God had power to do what he had promised. One thing about Abraham is that when God spoke something, he believed. In fact, in the book of Genesis, we read chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15, the Lord tells Abraham, I am your shield and your very great reward. After he came back from the defeat of the kings in Sodom and Gomorrah, when five kings attacked Sodom, he came back after defeating them. He didn't take any plunder from them. He didn't want people to say that the kings made Abraham rich, refused to take any plunder from the, uh, from the war. And the Lord tells him, I am your shield. I am your reward. As if to say, you didn't take the plunder, but you are not going to, not going to be the loser because I am your shield. I am your very great reward. Look at Abraham's response. What will you give me, Lord? What reward? What are you going to give me? I am childless. And the one who will inherit my possessions is going to be Eliezer from Damascus, who is actually a servant. My servant is going to inherit the Lord said, no, this man not inherit your, your inheritance. 
a, a son from her own body will, will inherit. And Abraham is very old at that point of time. Very old. From her own body, son will inherit the, land, the, the possession we have, the inheritance, and the offspring will be like the stars in the universe. Look up and see. Two things. One was he's very old. Are you going to have a son from your own body? Not your servant going to inherit your possessions. Whatever you give me. I'm childless. Abraham said, God said, no, no, no. Not your servant. Your a son from your own body will inherit. Then he says, you're going to have children like the stars in the universe. Look at verse 6. Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed. He believed. When God spoke, he believed. And it's credited to him as righteousness. He believed what God spoke. It was credited to him as righteousness. He was righteous because of his faith. In the same way you and me today are righteous because we believed in Jesus. We have put our faith in Jesus. He is our righteousness. That's how we accept Christ. We have made righteous by his blood. So we're going to go to heaven. We know that. Not only that, subsequently, after being born again, as we live for the Lord, we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. All of us. And as we live by faith, three things, very often I share these things, we live by three things the Lord has told us. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Then we read in the Bible, Galatians 5.16, Paul writes, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Number three, quoting the Old Testament, uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, Paul writes to the Romans, Romans 1.17, The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Old Testament says, Habakkuk 2.4, the just or righteous will live by faith. Today, we are righteous because we are made righteous by the blood of Christ. He has made us perfect by his blood. And after receiving the righteousness, who is Christ? 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Christ has become for righteousness. Thereafter, we live in this world by faith. And we will do well not to waver in our faith. Abraham did not waver through faith. In fact, the Greek word for uh, uh, wavering actually means staggering. Staggering. The word is staggering. staggering. See, when you walk, you know, when you walk, when you're not uh, uh, drunk, drunkard, for example, will stagger, will move sideways, isn't it? So it means when you walk with the Lord in faith, you won't stagger, you won't move here and there. You'll be firm. Your steps will be firm. There's no, you know, in the, in the, in the Bible you found there are people who waver in faith in the Old Testament time, especially in the Old Testament time. Even today, many people. But that's not the will of God for us. We live by God's instructions. We live by God's promises. And also, we are called to live up to God's standards. He has a standard for us that we are firm in our faith and don't stagger, don't waver, but are steadfast in our faith. So today's topic is like Abraham, unswerving, uh, unswerving in our uh, faith and walking steadfastly with the Lord our God. Now in the Old Testament time, we do read about the Israelites uh, whose faith was up and down. Their commitment to God was up and down. They didn't keep the commitment. Especially behind the book of Judges, uh, up and down they went. And there's a pattern in the Old Testament that uh, when they obeyed God, they were blessed. When they were blessed, they went away from God. When they went away from God, God used the enemies to come and attack them, Babylonians, in 587 BC. In 720 BC, Assyrians came to the northern kingdom of Israel. So enemies came and attacked them and overpowered them. They were taken exile to Babylon in 587 BC. After, after uh, Jeremiah prophesied, they didn't listen. And it happened that when they, when, when they complained to God, when, when they were when they, uh, blessed by God, they got uh, complacent. 
and they went away from God. And then they had difficulties. They cried out to God in the difficulties. God sent the prophets. When they listened to the prophets, they were restored back. So up and down you find a roller coaster relationship with God. Up and down, up and down. Faith sometimes very close, sometimes away. And usually when their faith was very sound and secure, and their obedience to God was secure, when the priests, the prophets and the leadership were close to God. When the priests were close to God, when the kings were close to God, people were close to God. When the kings went away, when the priests went away, when the prophets also went away, prophets in their own minds and from the Holy Spirit, not from the mouth of God, people went away. It depended upon the leadership. In fact, in the Old Testament, uh, Israel had 20 kings. Judah also had 20 kings, uh, apart from David and Solomon. The first David, then Solomon, then the, the, the kingdom split into two. Israel in the north, Judah in the south, and 20 kings in Israel, 20 kings in Judah. Out of the 40 kings, only eight were godly kings, only eight. And all eight were kings of Judah in Jerusalem. 32 kings were far away from God. So people went away. Even the priests sometimes went away. So but there, the, the people in, in Jerusalem and also in Israel, their faith depend upon the leadership. Sometimes today also many Christians say, you know, I am like the Israelites. Sometimes I am close to God. Sometimes I am from God. Sometimes my faith is sound. Sometimes I go away. When I go for a retreat, when I go for big meetings, I feel very happy. I'm the mountaintop experience. Then I come down the mountaintop and difficulties and my faith goes down. Why? Should not happen at all. We are primarily called to have fellowship with our Lord. Then people. Look at 1 John 1 3. John writes, We urge you to have fellowship with us, but our fellowship with the, with the Father and with the Son. Want you to have fellowship with us, but our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. You proclaim what is seen and heard. You proclaim what is seen and heard, then may have fellowship with us. So, in other words, true fellowship among God's people is only effective, only meaningful when you have fellowship with God. And now, when you understand that the ultimate perfect high priest is Jesus. And he is not backslidden. He's entered the Holy of Holies. When he is our high priest, there's no business for us to backslide. What a simple time. Priests went away, people went away. This priest is a perfect priest. Hebrews 7.25 says, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Perfect priest. Today lives for us, lives for us. And one of the amazing fact is he is the author and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one responsible for our faith, author of our faith, and finisher of our faith. He'll bring our faith. Till the day we die, he will sustain our faith. He will sustain our faith. As uh, uh, Christian prayed before he started, even though we are faithless, he remains faithful. Second Timothy 2.13. He remains faithful for he cannot disown himself. So first and foremost, remember, we live by faith, unwavering faith. God wants us to have standard for us, for every one of us. We live by word, live by the Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit will take the word and bring to us. He'll make the word come alive to us. He lives inside us. He's the author of the Bible. He will take the scriptures, the promises in the scriptures and bring to our heart and mind. Thereafter, we're called to believe that promise by faith and make sure our faith is not wavering, it is secure. Go back to, uh, to Abraham. Against all hope, 
based on circumstances. Is it was 100 years old? I mean, all hope based on circumstances. In hope in what God has spoken, he believed. He believed. I guess all hope based on circumstances. In hope in the Lord. And faith does not mean avoiding the facts. Faith is facing the facts. It says about Abraham, he faced the fact. His body was as good as dead. He's about 100 years old. At the age of 99, God told him about how Sarah was going to have a child. Sarah. Early at the age of 86, Ishmael was born. And God told him not through Ishmael, but through uh, Isaac, through the Sarah's child, you're going to have Still in the universe, child of promise. At 99, the Lord said, you're going to have son to Sarah. And God spoke to him. He believed what God spoke. Against all hope based on circumstances, in hope in the Lord, he believed. So became father of many nations. As we said of him, to him, so shall your offspring be. So we have to be like him. Believing the word of God that God brings to us and facing circumstances, yes. It says about him, he faced the fact that the body was as good as dead. He was 100 years old, about 100 years old, 99 actually, when he was promised uh, Ezra to Sarah. He faced the fact, body was 100 years old. Sarah's womb was also all, almost dead. But he didn't. He didn't waver in unbelief. He didn't weaken his faith. He didn't waver through unbelief. Being fully persuaded, he was strengthened actually in faith. Being fully persuaded, God had power to do what he had promised. So basically it means you and me live by the Spirit. Spirit will take a verse, a Bible promise from, from the Bible and give to us. As living by the Spirit and the Word. Can come through somebody, can come through a message, can come through their own Bible reading, can have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We are all called a fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He'll bring a promise to us. When He brings the promise to us, we are called to hold on to the promise by faith. Every Christian, born again Christian, Christian means born again only. If you're not born again, you can't, you're not a Christian. Because Christian means belongs to Christ. You belong to Him because He bought us by His blood. We respond to the gospel by inviting him into heart as Savior and Lord. You are born again. That's when you are a child of God. Now, having become a child of God, His Spirit comes and dwells in us. We spoke about that on Tuesday. Many things happen when we accept Christ. And He lives inside us. He is our teacher. He is our counselor. He is a reminder. So many other things He does in our lives. 20, 30 works of the Holy Spirit. So every one of us who is a believer, born again believer, is called to have fellowship with the Spirit. Second Corinthians 13 chapter verse 14. It's a benediction in most churches. Last verse of the second letter of Paul to Corinthians. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. When you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, in moments of crisis, moments of difficulties, in distress, he will take a scripture verse, which he wrote, the author of the Bible, and give to our hearts. When we live by the Spirit, he speaks to us, to the Word. Then we hold on to God's Word, we live by the Word. And through the Word, our faith increases, we live by faith. So simple. For every one of us, it is like that. Now, as we live by faith, Sometimes this faith unnecessarily can waver. It becomes wavering faith, unlike Abraham, unwavering faith. Why? Why does it waver? I'm going to identify some of the things that cause our faith to be shaken up a little bit. You know, unwavering means uh, unshaken. You know, uh, you don't stung, you don't stagger. Some people's faith is staggering. It should not happen. So, what are the things that cause us to? Stagger in our faith. First is circumstances. Being influenced and controlled by circumstances. Which did not happen in the case of Abraham. Look at the circumstance. 99 years old. Sarah is about 
at 90 years old. And God says she's going to have a child. Circumstances, very difficult to believe. Against all hope, based on circumstances, in hope in the Lord, God, what God spoke, he believed. And we should be like that. Sometimes circumstances are very, very negative, depressing. But we put our hope in the Lord and, and how nice to know that today, hope is Jesus. Jesus is hope. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 1. We did that in a study on Timothy also on Tuesday, on, on Monday. Jesus Christ, our hope. The Apostle Paul begins the letter of Paul Timothy, First Timothy chapter 1 verse 1 by saying, I, Paul, Apostle of Christ, by the command of God as Savior, a God our Father, and Christ Jesus, our hope. He is our hope. So when he is your hope, against all hope based on circumstances, in hope and what God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit, we know that God can change the circumstances. We face the fact that it is very, very difficult to uh, understand, but the Lord is in control. And he is a God who does what is best for us. Not just what is good for us. He does what is best for us. So sometimes what we see around us, sight affects our faith. Sight affects our faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 5, chapter 7, we live by faith, not by sight. If Abraham lived by sight, he would have wavered. He would have wavered. He would have been staggering in his faith. He lived by what God spoke to him. For you and me, every situation we face in life, you will find there are difficulties sometimes, distresses, suffering, persecution, all kinds of things happen. But then, in those situations, God will speak to us. The Holy Spirit who lives in us will take the scriptures and the promises in the scriptures, bring remembrance, and make us rise about difficulties while we face the facts around us, we believe in a God who will change the facts. In persuade that God had power to do what he has promised. When God promised something, he will fulfill. In the book of Numbers, 23rd chapter, verse 19, Balaam says to Balak, God is not a man that he should lie. The son of man should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? When God promises, he'll fulfill. When he speaks, he will act. In the book of Isaiah, 43 chapter verse 13, 43, 13, the Lord himself says, when I act, who can reverse it? No one can come in the way of God's plans. We believe that whatever the circumstances, against all hope based on circumstance, circumstances, in hope in what God has spoken, we believe. And therefore, we are truly children of Abraham. Now, as compared to Abraham, let's look at our, our disciples of Jesus. Uh, the flip side of, of Abraham. Later on, they must have changed um, uh, drastically, I know. But there was a point of time when the Lord told them, 8th chapter of Matthew, verses 23 to 27, Lord told them, let us go to the other side of the lake. lake. Let us go to the other side of the lake. They get into a boat, Capernaum. From there, they go towards uh, the eastern side of the lake of Galilee, Ganesha, uh, 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 where Jesus drove out this uh, demons, legion of demons. And I shared this before also. I calculated the distance when I was in Israel, when, I was in, uh, when Ram and me were together in Tiberias. We took, I took bearings on the compass and found out that distances are not more than four or five kilometers. And they get into a boat from the north towards the east. And if you look at the geography of the place, from the northwest, there's a valley like thing. From there, the, uh, suddenly the winds will come, it seems. We were there in different seasons, but there are two seasons in uh, Israel when the rain comes the autumn rain and the latter rains, on the, the spring rain and the latter rain. Suddenly, the uh, wind will come. So, when they got to the boat, what has God told them before? The Lord told them, Let us go to the other side of the lake. They get into a boat, 
and they go and Jesus falls asleep and the squall storm takes place and the disciples get very trusted. They look at the circumstances. They look at the rain and the wind and the storm and they tell Jesus, Lord, Lord, we're going to drown, we're going to drown. They wake him up. Master, Master, we're going to drown. Lord gets up. He first rebooks the winds and the waves. Then rebooks the disciples. Ye of little faith. Why were you afraid? Ye of little faith. Why were you afraid? Why were they afraid? Because they saw the storm. Sight. A couple of hours back, maybe a few minutes back, or maybe not more than four hours, Lord told them, let us go to the other lake. Let us go to the other side of the lake. Which means if I'm telling you you've got to go there, they're going to reach there. Not drown halfway. The Lord did not expect them to rebook the wind in the way. Why did he rebook them? He have little faith, he tells them. Why, did you, why, did you, why were you afraid? He didn't expect them to rebook the winds and the waves. He expected them to believe what he had said. He has said you're going there. Which means we will reach there. Why were you afraid? You saw the storm. You saw the winds and the waves. And you woke me up. Should have woken me up. Should believe what I said. Opposite of Abraham. Abraham had difficult circumstances. Difficult to understand. But he believed what God said. Here these guys, within a matter of few hours, Forgot what he said. They saw the, the situation, sight, and what happened? Faith was affected. You have little faith. Why were you afraid? So sight makes us waver in our faith. Second thing that affects our faith is related to that. And that is fear, anxiety. When you keep on looking at a problem, if it is not there, you look at the future and devil puts thoughts in our minds. We worry about the future and even though we have the promise of God in the Bible, we still worry about the future. Worries, anxieties affect our faith. We can know the promise in the Bible, but we should believe that. We we'll remember that and believe that. Anxiety affects our faith. When you have faith, there's no anxiety. Because your faith means believing what God has spoken. If you believe what God has spoken and act upon it, you won't waver through faith. As we believe what God has spoken, act upon what, what he's told us, then that, that fear will not affect us. Now, we know that we are not supposed to have anxiety. We have many, very often I share about this. And anxiety or worrying is actually a sin. In Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says, do not worry about your life. Now, how often when I tell people about not worrying, they say, uh, and I give them promise in the Bible. One promise for every one of us about worrying. Jeremiah 29, 11. Why we should not worry. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. When you just believe that promise, then we won't have worry at all because we know everything has planned for us in the future, which we don't come against. We don't interfere with his plans. We listen to his voice and walk in step with the spirit. Then we know everything works together for the good for us in the future. When I tell people about this promise, not to worry because he has said he has the best plans, People said, I know, brother, I know all these verses in the Bible about not fearing, but, but, why but? In the Bible, there are 36 verses, 316 verses which say, fear not, fear not, fear not. When you allow fearful thoughts to occupy your mind, then even though you may know the promises, you won't be able to manifest that and our faith gets affected, wavers, wavers. That's when we have to go to the Holy Spirit who lives inside us. He will give us the gift of faith. Gift of faith. Which is over and above our natural measure of faith. Now, every one of us has a measure of faith which is based on so many parameters. As we hear the word of God, faith increases. As we 
face difficulties joyfully as you obey God, faith increases. As you fellowship with God's people, faith increases. As you remember God's faithfulness in the past, faith increases. As you depend upon the anointing of the Holy Spirit, faith increases. So, there are times when we have these uh, fears bothering us. We just have to go to the Holy Spirit's counsel, have fellowship with Him, and He will give us the gift of faith to believe what God has spoken. God, you have spoken, I will believe. In spite of circumstances. Look at Mary about circumstances. When God told us he's going to have a child, conceive a child, she believed. Her question was, how will this be since I'm a virgin? She asked the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Luke 134. And the angel explains to her how it is going to happen. And then it says about her, about her faith, Luke 145. Blessed is she who is believed, the Lord has said to her, will be accomplished. So she just believed that it was going to happen. Never happened before. A virgin having a child. She just believed. We will learn from all these amazing examples in the Bible. So uh, in, in our case, as we look around, we find and look at the circumstances that causes sometimes for us to have anxiety and fear. Now, right now, we all know that what's happening all over the world, the COVID situation. The pandemic of COVID is not as serious as the pandemic of anxiety and fear. But then, when you trust in the Lord, you don't worry about these things. Because we know we are in the hands of God. He'll protect us. He will guide us. And one day, He will take us home. COVID or no COVID, one day, He will take us home. Till such time, we walk in His ways by faith. Now, as only faith uh, is affected by uh, anxiety and fear, because you can't think of God's uh, promises when your other things bother your mind. Put away every disturbing thought in your mind and simply hold on to God's promise and walk in his ways. In fact, most things we worry about don't happen. Most things we worry about never happen. I'll give you an example in the Bible. Jacob and Esau. As I was contemplating trying to kill Jacob after the father Isaac dies. And Rebecca comes to know about it. She tells uh, Jacob, you go away from here. Book of Genesis, chapter 27, 41 to 44. You go away from here. Because your brother, Esau, is contemplating trying to kill you after the father's days are over. That's why Jacob goes away. He goes to Laban, his uncle. And the mother tells him, you go away from here. When a brother, brother's anger subsides, I will send for you and you come back. That's why Jacob goes away. He spent 20 years there, acquires wives, acquires children, has children, men some, made some big, big paraphernalia of people he's got around him. Four wives, many children. 12 tribes of Israel came from there. And then after 20 years, the Lord tells him, book of Genesis 31st chapter verse 3, Go back, learn of your father's relatives. I will be with you. You go back. What did mommy tell him before he left her home? When Ezra's anger subsides, I'll send for you and you come back. So he goes. No news from mommy. But God told him go back. He goes back. Praise God. He obeys God. While going back, he's anxious because wondering. Will Ezau kill me? Ezau was a man of the country. He was a skillful hunter. Whereas Jacob was a home bird. He was sitting at home, looking at the soil. Jacob. Whereas Ezau was a skillful hunter. Different personality altogether. He's so scared of Ezau. But he goes back home. And they send messengers to Ezau. Because no news has come that Ezra's anger is upset. Is he still angry with me? He sends messengers ahead of him to Ezra as he comes back home. Tell him, uh, tell him I've got men servants, maid servants, cattle, donkeys. As we say, I'll give something to yours. Trying to hint at the bride. Messengers come back. 32nd chapter of Genesis, verses 6 and 7. They come back and they say, Ezra is coming. And 400 people are with him. And he says in verse 7, 
in great fear and distress. He divides his possessions. He divides all his things and trying to make plans how to meet Esau. What did God tell him before he left? You go back. I will be with you. If God be for us, who can be against us? We know that today, Romans 8, 31. But being a man of God, I'm sure in his heart he would have known these things. Because Abraham did not have the law of Moses, but he knew the law in his heart. It says in Genesis 26, chapter verse 5, Abraham kept the laws. How do you know the law? In the heart. So Jacob knew his God. He knew that God was for him. But then, while he knew that, still is worried. He's worried. What does this do to me? In great fear and distress, he divides the possessions. And finally, when he approaches Esau, the Bible says in the book of Genesis, 33rd chapter, verse 4, Esau comes running, hugs him and kisses him. What an anticlimax. He was so scared of Esau. For 20 years, he was scared, actually. Because mommy didn't say that Esau's anger is upset. It. But God told me, go back, I'll be with you. God did not say, Esau was okay now. Ezra's anger is upset. God didn't say anything about Ezra. Nothing about Ezra. You go back. I will be with you. That's enough, isn't it? But Jacob is worried. And even though God said, I'll be with you, he was doubting what was going to happen. That faith was wavering. Finally, what happened? Ezra comes running, hugs him and kisses him. Complete change. Proverbs 16, 7 says, when a man's ways are pleasing to God, he makes even his enemies live at peace. When a man's appeasing to God, he makes even enemies live at peace. That's what happened in the case of Jacob. He pleased God by going back home, even without getting a news that Ezra anger subsided. And Ezra comes running and hugs him and kisses him. And then in 10th verse, it says, Jacob is telling his brother, looking at you, is looking at the face of God. Looking at you, he is looking at the face of God. What an anticlimax. He was so scared of him. Now he says, after hug, he gets hugged by his brother, as if I'm looking at God, I'm looking at you. Amazing, isn't it? So we simply live by what God has spoken to us. Today we have no, we are not orphans that God doesn't speak to us. Yeah, he, he is a loving Heavenly Father. I'm not saying often God doesn't speak. I'm talking about uh, earthly parents we don't have. But we have the Heavenly Father, who is our Father. Psalm 68, verse 5. Father to the fatherless. Mother to people whose mothers have left them and gone. Isaiah 49, 15. He's a father and mother. He speaks to us. He loves to speak to us. So in our distress, he will speak to us. When you're anxious, go to the Holy Spirit. He'll give you a verse. When you remain anxiety, faith gets effect. So number one was sight. Number two related to sight is uh, uh, fear and anxiety. Number three, what can affect our faith, waver our faith is doubts, doubt. Having doubt is not uh, uncommon, nothing wrong in that. Please have the doubt clarified by the Lord. Having doubt, if, if how doubt remains, you don't go to God and get the clarification, it'll lead to lack of faith. It'll be, it'll be uh, faith, the lack of faith will be long, last for a longer period of time. Take John the Baptist. Even John the Baptist, who prophesied about Jesus. Look, the Lamb of God that takes the sins of the world. Look, the Lamb of God. John 1.29. And people went to Jesus. Those following uh, John, went, John the Baptist went out to Jesus. That's what his, his calling was. I must decrease, he must increase. Later on, when John the Baptist was in prison, after he was uh, put there by the, by the king, he sent messengers to Jesus. 11th chapter of Matthew, the first few verses. Send messengers. His disciples he sends. His disciples he sends to Jesus. Go and find out. Is he the one? Is he the Messiah? Or should we await someone else? The same man who prophesied by faith. Prophecy is always by faith. You know that? Prophesying is by faith. And he prophesied by faith. Now, he's sending messengers to Jesus. Go and find out. He's doubting his own prophecy. Look at that, the Lord deals with that. Send the disciples back. 
11th chapter of Matthew, the first few verses. We read, he sends messengers back and uh, with the message, go and tell him, go and tell him, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, lepers are healed, the dead are raised, good news is preached. All clarification. John the Baptist doubted. He doubted. But the Lord clarified. So, matter settled. So, when you have doubts, and keep the doubts to yourself and don't give it to God and say, Lord, uh, uh, teach me, Lord, then that will affect our faith. Because of faith, lack of faith, we doubt. It affects our faith. They were in faith. But he is a counselor, empowerer. He understands what they're going through. Understand, we are human. He remembers we are dust. So don't keep, don't keep the doubts to yourself. I learned always, whenever I had a doubt in those days, nowadays I don't have doubts about the faith, about the Lord, I don't have doubts. I had doubts before. Even before I came to Jesus, I had doubts about the Bible, what the Bible says. I wanted to know what the Bible says. I thought at that time that reincarnation is a reality, reincarnation. So I asked the Lord, living God, not even Jesus, I have not come to believe in Jesus. Living God, I have heard that when, when you die, we come back to life again, again, die again, come back to life, reincarnation. Is it true? I am doubting. Is it true or not? And I forgot about my question. Because always I put a question to the Lord, I forget about it. Because I am not sure they will answer or not. I put it to him and forget about it. He showed me from the Bible, Hebrews 9.27. Just as man is destined to die once and face judgment, Christ died once for sins of many, he will come again, not to bear sin, to bring salvation for those waiting for him. Hebrews 9.27 and 28. Yeah, clarify the doubt. Whenever you have a doubt, go to him. He's right there in your heart, the Holy Spirit. He'll take the scriptures, bring to remembrance. And again, doubting can happen when you look at circumstances. Take, for example, 14th chapter of Matthew, when the Lord is walking on the water, and these guys, the disciples, are in the boat, and fourth watch of the night, I mean, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., early morning, dark. Can you imagine how it will be? They see someone walking on the water. What a scene it is, no? Dark. 3 to 6, 6 a.m. in the morning, fourth watch of the night. And then they see this figure and walking. They think it's a ghost. They are scared. Very often they used to get scared. They think it's a ghost. And the Lord says to them, take courage, it's only I. Put in chapter Matthew, verse 22 to 31. Take courage, it's only I. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. So, Peter is seeing a figure on the, on, the, on the water. He thinks it's a ghost. And then uh, the, the voice says, take her, it's only I. Jesus' voice, they could hear. And then uh, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus says, come. Now he knows it's Jesus. He knows it's Jesus. And Jesus says, come. And Peter walks on the water. He sees Jesus. He hears Jesus. Then what happens? He looks down at the water. There's a, there's a uh, probably a wind or waves buffeting. And he looks at the water and he sinks. He thinks he's going to drown. And by the way, even in the other case, I told you about the uh, boat uh, where they were about to drown this master, master, wake up. Don't forget, they're fishermen. All fishermen know how to swim. How can they think they're going to drown? They're all professional fishermen, professional swimmers. Still, they thought they're going to drown. Here also, fell to the water, he's not going to drown. And being a sing, the Lord, so why do you doubt? Why do you doubt? When you see Jesus, they saw physically, we experienced him today in our lives. When you hear him, then when doubt comes, he will clarify the doubt. So why do you doubt? He walked by faith on the water. And then he saw it. it's not happening. This should, this should not happen. I'm walking in the water. It's unusual. So the circumstances. And he doubted. So doubting can affect our faith. But then again, go back to the Lord. He'll clarify the doubt. He'll settle everything. And uh, as we grow in the Lord, the times of wavering will reduce. Intervals will reduce. Duration will reduce. It does not mean when you walk closely with God, you'll never have 
waver in faith. The point is, as we grow in the Lord, the intervals between wavering will be long, long intervals between the wavering. When you waver, very short, very short time. Because you go to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, clarify. So don't fear wavering. He the author and finisher of our faith. He will sustain our faith. Yes, we in the world we face difficulties, and uh, but the, our faith in the word of God should not falter at all. Application can sometimes falter. We know what we have to do. We don't do it. That's our problem. There's never a problem with God. He will never fail us nor forsake us. It's the nature of God. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So three things. One is sight. Other is anxiety. Third is doubt. Fourth is neglecting a clear conscience. We neglect a clear conscience, it affects our faith. We must have a clear conscience. Because when you have a clear conscience, you can believe God's promise in your life. You may know it, you may not believe it. Because you believe by faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, 18-19, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Timothy, I give, this, I give this instruction. In keeping with the prophecies made about you, I give, the, I give the instruction, in keeping with the promises made about you, that by following them, you will fight the good fight. Holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected this and have shipwrecked their faith. I repeat the statement. Timothy, I give the instruction, in keeping with the prophecies made about you, that by following them, you will fight the good fight. Holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some people have rejected this, have rejected this, shipwrecked their faith. It's when you reject that clear conscience, you shipwreck the faith. And yet, second letter of Paul Timothy writes, Second Timothy, fourth chapter, verse 7. I have fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith. So good fight is do the faith. What comes in between? Neglecting a clear conscience. And Paul had a clear conscience. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. The God whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience. So for the sake of our relationship with God, for fighting the good fight, we need to have a clear conscience before God. When something comes the way of that clear conscience, confess that sin, forsake it, and make sure you are right with God. Then what happens is, you'll be able to hold on to God's promise. Otherwise, you may know the promise. You may not be able to have faith. It will happen to you. It's like, for example, the ninth chapter of uh, Mark, read the story about how Jesus went up the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. And when they come down the mountain, there's a man below, along with the remaining disciples. And the disciples are trying to drive out demons from a son of this man. The man has a son who was possessed by demons. He threw the, the, the demons threw him into water, into fire to kill him. They said they're trying to drive out demons. They're not going. The Lord comes down with Peter, James, and John. Ask him what's happening. The father says, my son is possessed by evil spirits. They throw them into fire or water to kill him. Uh, but if you can have pity upon us, help us. The disciples tried to drive out the demons. The tried to drive out the demons. They didn't go. And he said, if you can, have pity on us and help us. Mark 9, 20, 24. Jesus says, if you can. In other words, how can you say if you can? And then he said, ask them a question. Don't you believe that everything is possible for him who believes? Don't you believe that everything is possible for him who believes? The father says, you know, they are disciples to drive out the demons, they're not going. If you can, can you have pity on us and help us? He says, if you can. I will say, how can you ask me if you can? Don't ask such questions. That's what he's implying to him. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it. That's what God is saying. How can I say if you can? And, and then what happens? This man says, the Lord tells him, everything is possible for him who believes. Everything is possible for him who believes. For one who believes, everything is possible. And this man says, the father of the boy, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. I believe, 
help me overcome my unbelief. Does he believe or doesn't believe? What he means is, I believe that everything is possible for him who believes. But I am not that him. I am not that him. For him who believes, everything is possible. I believe that. But I am not able to believe for my own son it will happen. That's the case of many, many people who know the promises, who know God's nature, is a loving, gracious God, loves to bless us, yet when it comes to making that, uh, appropriating the promise in their own lives, they're not able to believe. Maybe because our conscience is affected by our lives. So it's important for us always to have a clean conscience before God. And the best way is, in fact, the only way is, remember, by the blood of Christ, our conscience has been cleansed of every sin. Otherwise, it will contaminate our spirits by faith. When you do something wrong, we have a disturbed conscience. Confess that sin. Forsake it. Repent from it. Ask him to help you repent of it. And then, thank him for the blood. By that blood, once and for all, our sins have been cleansed. Hebrews 10, 14. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever, forever, those are being made holy. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, where you're talking about how by the blood of Christ, our hearts are sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Cleanse us completely. The blood cleanses our spirits from every sin. So very simple, first have a clean conscience. Face up to God. Don't try to avoid God. When you avoid God, what happens? All the problems come. And at that point of time, we waver in faith. We may know the promise, but can't believe it's going to happen in my life. It will happen to others, not for me. God shows no favoritism. Ephesians 6, 9, no favoritism with God. Romans 2, 11, no favoritism with God. Acts 10, 34, no favoritism with God. That's the nature of our God. So we hold on to God's nature and thank him for every promise he's given us and hold on to God's promise by faith. Again, coming back to summarize, we live by the spirit, Galatians 5.16. We live by the word, Matthew 4.4. 4, and we live by faith. Very interestingly, as we live by the spirit, he speaks to us from the scriptures. Promise will come. instruction will come. Sanders will come, like today's standard, live up to unwavering faith. And then as we respond to both these two, we'll find the author of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, makes us rise above circumstances in all the areas of sight, anxiety, doubt, and bad conscience are all, all dealt with by the Lord. It's joyful life it is. Consistent life. One mistake many people make is when they're not right with God, they avoid God. They avoid God. And they miss out on God's grace. Look at Peter before he became a believer. Here's Jesus preaching by the lake of uh, Gennesaret. He's nearby mending the nets, repairing the nets, not listening to Jesus. The Lord knew his problem. He hadn't got any fish. Makes him sit in the boat. That's the day when he became a disciple of Jesus. Never make the mistake of avoiding God when you're not right with God. Get right with God. Simply come back to him. Come clean before him. He'll settle our conscience. And he'll do what's best for us. And he will make us stand firm in faith. Not wavering faith. But like Abraham. Believing in a God who can change our circumstances. And a God who calls things that are not as though they are. Ask God for faith. Faith is a gift of God. He's the author and perfecter of faith. Ask God for unwavering faith. Tonight I'm going to pray for all of us. We'll have unwavering faith. Trusting in God and not getting carried away by all these unwanted distractions in our Christian world. Let's close our eyes. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank and praise the Lord for each one of us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Faith is a gift from you, Lord. Thank you for drawing us to you, Lord. Help us walk with you intimately and closely. Not get bogged down by circumstances. Not be influenced by anxiety. Not be controlled by doubts. And help us keep a clean, clear conscience before you, Lord. And walk steadfastly before you, Lord. 
you the author and perfecter of our faith, Lord. Help us walk with you, Lord, intimately and closely. And be a blessing to others as you bless us, Lord. Lord, I also pray for all those who are affected by illnesses in the family and among friends, Lord. We pray for the COVID situation, Lord, that there are so many, Lord, who are affected. We pray your perfect will takes place for them, Lord. We pray, Lord, that those who are hungry for you, who have got a purpose for their lives, Lord, they be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed in Jesus' name. Those of us who are, uh, who are healed, Lord, I pray they will serve you, Lord. And those who finish their work on this earth, Lord, that you will take them home, Lord. But not before, Lord, they accept you as Savior, Lord. Let no one be lost, oh Lord, in this world who is not accepted you as Savior, Lord. We pray for their salvation. Your will is known, perishes, all come to repentance, Lord. Give us wisdom to know, Lord. But we pray for so many things, Lord, that your will be done, not our will. We want to give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you.